Good afternoon. Are your bellies nice and full, but not too full? This is a little bit of a tough time of day, I know. It's good to have all of you in here. My name is Mary Ann McKibben Dana. I am a former member of the Next Church Strategy Team, currently serving uh, on the advisory team. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all back after lunch on day two of this conference and also to introduce you to Ken Evers Hood or introduce him to you, you to one another. My first memory of Ken was at General Assembly a couple of GAs ago. I think it was when we were in Portland. And we were still kind of young enough as next that we were trying to find little quirky things to do at GA to kind of raise our profile and help build our brand as uh, something a little bit different in the church. And one of the things that we decided to do is to have kind of an improv flash mob out in the main outside the main hall of GA. And Ken was one of the extremely small handful of people to do that with me. But once you've done improv together, you know that that bonds people like, like almost nothing else. So Ken and I are friends for life, thanks to that. But, but even more substantially, Ken is one of those thinkers that you read or you experience his work and you think, yes, this. It just resonates on a really deep level, and we are grateful for his gifts. I know the people in his congregation are also grateful for 14 good years of ministry together at Tualatin, close enough, Tualatin, doggone it. I got in my own head. Uh, 14 good years there and uh, a great deal of, of pastoral heart, and I am confident that what Ken shares with us today will have us all saying, yes, this, on a deep level. So join me in welcoming Ken Evers Hood. Thank you uh, for that. So when Susan Thornton called me to ask me if I wanted to speak at Next, my answer was, yes, are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. And then she said, oh good, because we're really hoping that you will speak about doing ministry with depression. And I was like, oh, ah, ah. I don't know, Susan, if you could feel that. But I was like, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. I, I had like this immediate image that came into my uh, head of perfect strangers coming at, at, uh, up to me going, oh, you're the depression guy. Um, or worse, because this place is filled with pastors, David Norris, you'd come up to me and be like, oh, Ken, are you okay? I, uh. So I told her I needed some time, and it took some time. What brought me around was a memory that I had about 18 years ago. It was a conference like this. I was brand new in ministry. I felt lost. I was struggling. And conferences like this, everybody seems to know everybody, and everybody's living their great life. And I was at a table, and I admitted, yeah, I'm kind of struggling. And there was this dude, there was this guy who said, well, gosh, things in my ministry, they're, they're just getting better and better. Preaching's just easier and easier. And I was like, oh, and I felt more lost and like, maybe I'm in the wrong place. So I thought if there's anything, I have some technical issues. There we go. Thank you, Megan. If there's anything that one of us as, as a leader here could do to be more vulnerable and more honest about how the perfect social media ministry life that I would love for you to believe is true isn't, and if there's anyone here that is feeling lost, that that might help you feel just that much more connected I thought, all right, that's worth it. So I do live with depression. Uh, I do ministry with depression. One of the ways that uh, I stay grounded in my soul 
is I write and perform poetry. Uh, what I'd like to do this afternoon is talk about four layers of how I understand ministry with depression, and I'll offer you four pieces I've written that have, have helped me. Uh, for many people, when they discover they have depression, it's like a fog that has rolled in, and it is hard to pinpoint exactly when it started. I know the exact day. Uh, it was MLK Monday five years ago, the preschool that all of my kids have gone to. They called me. They said, Ken, it's an emergency. We need you to come. Uh, my two-year-old, Bryn, was okay. But the little girl sitting next to her at lunch, she had choked on a meatball, and she would die the next day. And I cared for the family. I didn't know them. I cared for the family. I cared for the teachers that I did know and love. And I cared for our whole community. Uh, we had her memorial at our church. Her body was present in a four-foot-long pink coffin. We got through that. We got through that. But about three months later, I was not sleeping. I was not eating well. I was getting angry and irritable. And my wife finally said, Ken, you're not okay. You need to get some help. And she was right. As I see it now, I realize that the thread of depression has been woven through probably my whole life. But that was the time where I couldn't get through without some good therapy and the adventure of medication. Amen. Amen. So I wrote a piece uh, at that time called Theodicy. It comes from a story that Sang Lee tells at Princeton Seminary when he moved there with his family. His young daughter got swept up in floodwaters and uh, died. He said the only person at that august institution that helped him, the only person that helped was a very young Bob Dykstra who just showed up at his office and sat down and didn't say a thing. Theodicy. Above to clouds we cast our eyes beneath an empty sky. Either you do not see God, or could it be you forgot the covenants you cut, the promises you made and gave to a stranger in a strange land? He told her to be careful. If he told her once, he told her a thousand times to stay away from the edge, to keep a safe distance from the Leviathan waters that would tear her from that ledge, macerating her young body, now lifeless ragdoll, rolling beneath the waves, while an omnipotent, loving God looked on. Painful was every face, a question mark. Worse, the religious attempts to smooth over and console. Surely there must have been a reason some good that would come useless, these attempts at sympathies designed to distance. No, the only thing that helped was his young friend who came and sank into silence while he sat at his desk and stared. A hushed xenia between them shared as the chasm between hope and faith yawned. And 10,000 dark animal feelings zooed inside their cold, caged, hearts. I was taught in seminary that the deeper the grief, the fewer the words, that what we really have to offer is just our presence and showing up. What I didn't understand 18 years ago is how painful it is to sit in that darkness with others and that vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, is a real thing. No matter how good our boundaries are, when we care for someone in grief, it rubs off a little bit. And if you do not have solid ways of connecting with your soul and caring for yourself, you will either leave ministry, and many of us do, or you will become, as we heard from Mary Ellen Azada yesterday, a husk of who you know you can be, a husk of a pastor. So please, Get a counselor, get a coach, get a group you can be honest with, get a dog, <laughs> <laughs> whatever it takes. Do it before the pink coffin. Second layer I wanna to talk to you about is what I call the strange, unexpected grief of ministry. The strange, unexpected grief of ministry. 
almost everyone I know who leads in the church at some point when they were young had a wonderful sense of connection with the church. They were cared for and they were loved. They, they had something of a mess inside and the church wrapped their arms around them and they were, they were known. That's why they are leaders. That's why we are leaders. And the strange, unexpected grief of ministry is when we, we become leaders, the church is not there any longer to care for us. It's our role to care for them. And when they need us to show up, we have to be professionals who show up, who listen, and, and all of this that we bring, this mess that we bring, they don't need that then. And yet we are human and have it. And so we discover this strange, unexpected grief. One of my best friends, we're in a group together, and one holy week, he had struggled, really lost his faith in the resurrection. Super convenient time, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and he said to our group, how am I supposed to preach about Easter? What am I supposed to say faithfully about Easter when I don't even know what I believe? He could not bring that to them. He worked it through with us and with others. What I saw, what I witnessed, is in the midst of all of this, he kept showing up, he kept praying with them, he kept loving them, he kept preaching as well as he could until he came out the other side. This is a piece I wrote called Resurrection is Not an Argument. It's for him and for all of us who struggle. Resurrection is not an argument. It is not a belief to which you might agree or not and move on unchanged. Resurrection is a weed, her roots cracking into concrete. Resurrection is the thin Tian An Men man, white shirt, facing down four machines of war. Vulnerability, his only weapon. Vulnerability, his only weapon. Resurrection is the dwarf mountain hemlock fighting through rhyme, ice growing sideways, stunted from the howling wind, but growing anyway. And resurrection is you showing up one more time to a place you don't understand, to a love you know you don't deserve, hoping she is right when she says you never disappoint. Resurrection is not an argument. It is not a belief. It is a song sung in another tongue that somehow still brings tears to flow. It is the warm hand finding your shivering shoulder on the coldest night when you have turned away. Resurrection is life and stepping into life when all you know for sure is the shadow of death. So sitting with people in grief, we feel it, it carries over, it's cumulative. The church is not here to care for us. The third layer I wanna talk about, what happens when it's the church itself that is the one hurting us? Yeah, amen. <laughs> When I was 19 and just beginning to wonder, do I have a sense of call? And that was terrifying to me. I reached out to a, a person that I knew and loved. He was a pastor, he was wise. And I called him up and said, on spring break, can I come and visit you? I imagined that we would talk about God and faith and we would discern together. On the first morning that I was there, I would learn that he had other ideas about why I was there. So I was in his guest room and without my permission, he had entered the room and I woke up to his hands massaging my back. And I can just tell you there was something hungry and wrong in his touch. And I would love to tell you that I used my words and told him to stop that I told him to go away, but I was paralyzed. I was 19 and I was confused and frightened and angry. And, and this is the real mind twist. I loved him. I cared about him and I was worried about him. I knew he shouldn't be doing this and could be in trouble. So I just played dead. It's the only thing I knew how to do and I was fortunate that morning. He just got 
angry and frustrated and pouted and left, but there was a week ahead of us. I won't share anymore, I don't need to. The scars that he left are healed, but I don't believe they will ever be gone. We have to talk about hashtag me too. We have to talk about hashtag church too. The light is the only thing that will disinfect this. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. I wrote this piece last fall when Professor Christine Blasey Ford was offering the most courageous testimony I have ever seen anyone give. It's called Cassandra's Daughters. It comes from that myth where Apollo fell in love with Cassandra, gave her the gift of prophecy, and then cursed her with nobody believing her when she did not requite his advances. Cassandra's daughters, did it happen all at once, or did it come on more gradually, losing your credibility bit by bit like the leaking of a slow dripping faucet? The gift he gave you, he could never take back, but he could send you on with something grisly and new, his childish tantrum rage, his godly hatred for you. And when you sensed those spies shifting inside the makeshift wooden horse and called them out to the ones you trusted the most, their roll-eyed cackles left you for dead on that cursed coast. I was eight years old. I was eight years old when I saw them emerge from that impossibly small hole they bore in our square, thick carved front door all spring long on Brookside Drive in Hearst, Texas, carpenter ants with their leg hammers and auger jaws hollowed out that heavy wood faster than crafty Odysseus ever could. There are ants in there, my eight-year-old voice said. There are ants in there, I said to shaking, disbelieving heads. Sure, I was seeing things. They didn't see until they all swarmed out, a flying black pool, the door disintegrated, malignant with insects half full. Cassandra's line continues still. Her daughters have grown legion. Cassandra's line continues still. Her daughters have grown legion. When they speak up at once, some hiss that they lie. When they wait for decades, the same voices say, it's the wolf that they cry. But after Harvey Weinstein, Bill Clinton, Al Franken, and Cosby, Professor Ford, Anita Hill, and Monica Lewinsky, how long will we wring our hands over some man's reputation? that we deafen our ears to our daughter's cries, complicit in their further degradation. Hashtags can help, and movements are good. But from the beginning, this has been personal. And it comes down to you and to me. So hear this invitation to a real conversation. If you have a scar to share, and you don't know what to do, It is not your fault, and it never was. And if you trust us, we will believe in you. One of the things that I discovered, men are almost always the perpetrators, but they they choose men and women as their victims. But the difference I have found as I only started sharing this story two years ago is that when I have shared this, not once has anyone asked me, are you sure that really happened, Ken? Is there maybe something you might have said that gave him the wrong impression? We need to do better. I want to leave you with some light. Um, (laughs) Normally when I perform poetry, I do like courage, and it's like happy and exciting. Depression often runs in families, it runs in mine. And when I was a a boy, my mom suffered from a debilitating depression. Part of it was a physical illness, part of it was an abusive marriage. But when I was a kid, she would have this mantra. She'd say, you can mess your life up, and she didn't use the word mess. She would, you can mess your life up when you're 18, and you can never fix it. It's heavy to hear as a kid. And there was a time when I believed what she said was true, that she just really was broken. Here's the thing, 30 years later, 30 years later, she remarried an amazing man. My kids know him as Grandpa John. And she's done the work. 
She's full of life. People today would have no idea the person she was so long ago. And when I am feeling completely broken, when I feel like I've just messed up but there's no fixing it, I look at her and I remember healing really is possible. It takes time and it's complicated and it goes backwards. And, but healing does happen. This is a piece I wrote for her called Not Running But Dancing. It comes from Mary's story when the angel announced to Mary and she left over the desert. She made haste, Luke says, made haste over the desert. I've read so many interpreters, men interpreting this thing. She was running away. What does she do when she gets to Elizabeth's? She sings. She wasn't running. She was dancing. This piece is called Not Running But Dancing. She wasn't running away. She wasn't running away to hide her face. She wasn't digging, digging a tunnel 10,000 feet deep with a shovel of shame. She wasn't running, throwing her arms up around her like guardrails on 101, the only thing keeping her from the fur-tossing, rock-crushing blue depression beneath. She wasn't running away. She wasn't running at all. Not running but dancing, dancing to a song the angels are singing that only the heart can hear, dancing without the help of a husband to lead the way, dancing without sonogram in hand, that black and white hazy little alien, the sometimes thumb-sucking, always certain proof that she was not making this up. She was dancing without an affidavit from the Holy Spirit to whom it may concern. <clears throat> <laughs> the child is mine, so put down your rocks. The rocks in your hands, the worst rocks flying from your mouths, having fallen down from the loose rocks in your head. She's just scared, and so are you. She was dancing, dancing across the desert at night, dancing across moon-drenched sand, dancing across the rules and expectations, dancing across this isn't how we do things around here, dancing across nice girls don't get knocked up, and nice girls definitely don't get knocked up and then lie about it. Holy Spirit? Holy cow, girl, you couldn't come up with something better than that, even if you did believe it? <laughs> she was dancing across, what are they saying about me? Dancing across the voices inside of herself, saying you can mess your life up and you can never fix it. She was dancing across it all. She was, well, she was dancing across. Dying to the girl the world wanted her to be and rising to become a mystery. And this strange stranger, she couldn't keep her feet from moving the smile off of her face or the song out of her mouth. Who would they be, she wondered, her and this little one, hitching a ride, growing inside. Whoever they'll be never has been, and yet somehow always was, is, and ever shall be, scattering the proud, feeding the hungry, and lifting up what has been held down for far too long. She was dancing that night for herself and all the girls like her. For the girls who got pregnant when the world said they shouldn't, for the girls who didn't get pregnant or couldn't when the world said they should. For the girls who lost their babies or gave them away, dying a little inside as the dream of their little one slowly slipped away. For these she danced and dances still. She danced for the sun growing inside of her and all the boys like him. For the boys who have to look to their father in heaven because the one here on earth keeps forgetting to call for the boys who will grow up and care for others as they were cared for by them, for the men who will rise up and say, no, you can't talk like that. They're just scared and so are you. She was dancing for them, for these she danced. She was dancing for Abraham and all his children. You are one of them, so am I. Church, synagogue, mosque, church, synagogue, mosque, all Abraham, all the time, and the love that binds us together is so much stronger than the fear driving us apart. For these, she danced and dances still. She wasn't running away that night. She was dancing. And if it could happen to her, it could happen to you, to me. Do you see? Do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? Because there's music in the air everywhere. A song the angels are singing that only the heart can hear. And if you hear it, just a little, if it gets inside of you just a little, 
then when you leave this place, you won't be running away. You'll be dancing. Friends, thank you for your time. Thank you for your ministries. Hold on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ken. As you were talking, I was thinking about the phrase, when people describe um, a real pain, they sometimes say the pain was exquisite. And I've never really understood that phrase, the kind of delicate tenderness, and I understand it now. And so thank you, Ken, for sharing and speaking into exquisite pain, into exquisite hope with exquisite words. We will have a talk back and forth with Ken in the Whitworth room following the next testimony, and that'll be about 2.30. We'll be in there if you would like to join us to continue this uh, time of testimony. And now I'd like to turn it over to Bertram Johnson, uh, and first we'll have an announcement. Um, thank you, Ken, for that. That was rich and deep and vulnerable, and um, just a reminder that we do have chaplains available. Some are in the narthex or use the text information on the app if you would like to speak with a chaplain. <laughs> 